So 
so in general, what, one of the reasons to do it is so that you understand what it's like to be one of the guinea pigs that you're going to be asking us to do a survey uh, you know, in your jobs. Okay, when we're doing new experience work, we do lots of surveys, lots of interviews. We're going to be doing the surveys and interviews in a bit more detail in a few weeks' time, not actually after um, Easter vacation. Okay, so it's also useful to actually have some idea about what it's like on the other end to be doing these kind of surveys. When you're doing, the, when you're looking at the survey, look at how the questions are designed. Are they leading you into some into some sort of uh, um, bias outcome? Okay. I must be thinking when you're answering these questions, what is the purpose of this question? Is it, is it bias or isn't it bias? You've got to start to be critical of all of this. <coughs> so actually doing that survey might be a good idea because then you, know, you guys can tell the, the survey meisters at, uh, at um, what did you say? It's just mine, yeah. Uh, you, can see, you can see what they're trying to do. You can see whether they're doing it, whether they do the survey at the very well. Okay. Um, sorry about last week. I was ill. I'm still a little bit ill, so if I faint on the floor or uh, you know I'm uh, croaking or I have to stop, then that's just the way it is. Uh, see now, I've got this terrible. I don't know what it is. It's just terrible, terrible. Cold things. So, well, I'm very contagious, I'm sure. So uh, if you come close, uh, keep a good distance so that you don't get infected. Um, this one, this this lecture is going to be about usability. And we're going to slightly, we've slightly change the programme such that ne next week it's going to be about engagement, engaging experience. And the week after, we're going to have a bit on, um, on um, aesthetics. Um, and then we're going to um, have our BBC lecture okay, from the uh, guys. Now, um, talking of next week, I want to introduce Mark El Vigo in the front. Hey. Who is going to uh, give you a lecture next week? Uh, because I'll be in Chicago, uh, or I'll be on a plane to Chicago, um, so I won't be able to for a research meeting. So I won't be able to um, to lecture that day. Okay, but Mark L's uh, a good guy, and he knows everything there is to know about HCI. His PhD was in that, so you know he's uh, he's well trained in this kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. What is important about next week, apart from that Mark L is doing work? And I'll be being bored rigid on the damn plane for 11 and a half hours. Deadline. Huh? Deadline. 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 Deadline for coursework next week. So we have a coursework deadline. Remember, it's 10 o'clock um, next Wednesday. You've all had the feedback for your coursework that you've already done. Nice feedback. Um, obviously, as per normal, I won't be here to give you an exception or an exemption, even if that was ever going to happen, which it isn't. Okay, so no point in asking. Just get it done. Unless, of course, you capture my virus, in which case you should have done it already. Okay, so there's no excuses at all. So we're all happy, we're all comfortable with the coursework. We're going to have a look at the coursework in a little bit more detail, um, just when we get nearer to the um, coffee break. But we all have, has any of you looked at the coursework yet? Okay, a few. And what do we think to the coursework? Does it seem okay. yeah, straightforward? Yeah, reasonably good. It's more of a it's a bite article this time, isn't it? So it's it's sort of a little bit less um, academic, a little bit less uh, scientific, a bit more uh, in the computer science domain. Okay, okay. So if you've got any questions about the coursework um, or how to go about uh, doing it, then obviously you can ask me now. You know, sort of at the break time, etc. Okay, so let me switch the. Uh, so pop quiz from last week. Well, not from last week. From, I'm going to say last week all the time, just because I'm going to say that, even though it wasn't last week. So it's too easy. Uh, why is accessible accessibility for everybody? An example of why accessibility is for everybody. Of course, an example you've not been taught might be a good for a region. So, why is accessibility for everyone? Yes? Uh, is it something that if you're going to understand what um, the needs of a really impaired really, uh, user, for example, you're going to understand better about the sort of standards? Yeah, that's 
so that it fits into different kinds of machinery for people with um, uh, for accessibility, sort of assistive technologies, means that you also might be able to fit that, it might be more flexible for other kinds of um, interactions and interfaces that you guys have not actually thought of when you were building the system. If it's too, too tightly coupled with the program logic, then that's where you really get a problem, interactions with it. Okay? Okay. Oh, what's your view? This is very useful. What's your view regarding common... Well, what is common impairment? Because it were lots of things like sight and hearing or a little bit impaired, typically for older people. Yes, typically for older people. So it's where all you know, you've got lots of little, little bits of um, impairment. You might have tremor, a little bit of tremor, but you're not completely physically disabled. Um, you uh, might have a little bit of uh, sight loss or low vision. You might have a little bit of hearing, hearing loss. So these things, low level stuff in combination. So I, I talk a lot about, or I talk some about combinatorial impairment and about aging. What do I think about it? Okay. What do you think about it? More to the point. What's your view? A view. Yes. And is it, it can be kind of a barrier because. When you design for accessibility, you tend to think of only one thing at a time, maybe. Then okay. say for someone that's blind, but if you've got them combined, it's a bit more difficult for you to kind of find a solution. Okay, yeah. And there was something in there about like, young versus old people <coughs> trying to do different things, and I, was, I kind of thought on reading that it was, it was sort of more of a confidence thing with elderly people rather than actual mobility. Yeah, confidence. They don't struggle with their actual nerve. Yeah, that's true. Confidence and hesitancy. Yeah. Any others? So, my view was that in the disability domain, we're all shouting around, and people tell us, certainly say in the, the W3C, oh, well, if you've got a disa if disability, includes aging. Is aging a disability? Or is it just combinatorial impairments of disability, which happens to be prevalent in people who are and who are maybe older, but is that's not their only uh, demographic. Okay? So that's what I might think, but maybe other people who are in who are building ISO standards or, or are in W3C, they use aging as a code for this combinatorial impairment idea. Okay? So why why is one better than the other? Why do I get motivated by uh, calling those people who use aging, you know, idiots? <laughs> really? See, more governments. Okay, well, you need to have an opinion on this. It's almost like an excuse. It's an almost like an excuse. It's like saying that, well, everybody who's aging is in some way disabled. Well, that's not the case as far as I'm aware. <coughs> So why are we as unspecific with the language for ageing when we should be using something like combinatorial impairment when that can happen at any particular age? Okay, it might, there might be a greater instance of it when we're getting older, possibly, statistically, but that doesn't matter. There's still lots of people who it makes no difference to who aren't combinatorial impaired when they're older and are just as good at using computer machinery. They're slightly more hesitant because... Why are people slightly more hesitant if they're older? That's one reason they haven't grown up with it, but there's another, another sort, of, sort of slightly more deeper cognitive reason, yes. They don't expect it to be going to do it? 
They don't expect to be good at it, yeah? They're not expected to be good at it. They're not expected well. to be good at it, that's true, yeah. So expectations, as we've spoken about before, really dictate how you're going to interact with something, so that's very true, yeah? Any others? It's so difficult to change the way people um, do things, because other people tend to do things in a certain way, but they don't want to change. Okay, that's kind of right, but slightly wrong. So what it is, is that older people want to make the right decision the first time. So they spend more, more time going through the actual information to find whether that's going to be the right thing. Whereas most young people who have grown up with this kind of stuff just click, get it wrong, click, get it wrong, click, get it wrong. Tell me, why does this matter in, say, HCI kind of, in an HCI, in a quantitative HCI kind of world? I was going to say, if they can't see how to do it right at the first time, they might not do it at all. True, but think about the kind of measurements of some euphemism. Like, they're like tiny. When you're measuring the time it takes to do an action, it's going to be longer because they're looking at it and considering rather than clicking around and just hoping that they're getting the right one. Yes. So does it seem as though somebody who's younger is uh, way faster because their time to their complete their click time, time to click is way quicker? Yeah, it could be the wrong answer. Yeah, it's obvious. Yeah, it's good. It's it's like you know, there's a lot of big error rate in that. Okay, whereas something that's slower, it seems like it's slower, quantitatively, you're measuring it, but that's not the story because it might be the error rate of people getting the, the choice wrong is zero. So there's a difference there. So you've got to think about all these things when you're doing this kind of work. Okay, we won't pick an interface bridge and describe it. Do you know what an interface bridge is? MSAA, Microsoft Access. Accessibility, yeah. So it just provides an API for sort of describing what the interface and the screen sort of like screen. Like yeah, it provides a bridge between the say Java or between the actual system code and the assistive technology. And that bridge is important because it means it takes a lot of work away from you as software engineers. Because what that means is that as long as you fully comment or fully describe, if you like, the components of the interface as we were talking about. If you remember, then you get all this for free because the interface bridge works out what it needs to do from the fully described control, the fully described interface. Okay. What's the relationship between effective and accessible? I'm going to leave that one because we're going fast already. Five main <coughs> principles of effective design. Now, if I was if I was mem memorizing these uh, five principles of effective design. Well, there's originally four principles of effective design which everybody agree on, and then I'm just evil and we decide to go for five. So, what are the four, what's the acronym for those four principles of accessibility, if you like to call it? Yes, poor, P O U R. Yeah? Perceivable, operable, understandable. Robust, robust, poor. Okay, so what's my five? How do I um, get over the other engines? Yes. Poof. Okay, I still remember poof. Okay, so remember there's a difference between those two, especially when you get out into the real world that people will be talking to you about poor and then you should tell them why they're wrong. Okay, then you should look at, uh, look at my versions. Okay, right, let's move on to this. Efficient experience. So tell me, we've got this discussion here, so we can look to effects. Has some effect. It's uh, adequately operative. Okay. This bit is interesting here. Adequately operative. So what does that lead you to think about when we're talking about this kind of efficient experience? Well, of course, I'm calling it usability, or people call it usability, I'm calling it efficient experience. Well, this adequately operative. What does that mean to lots of people with regard to HCI, the old, the old school HCI? Yeah. Could it mean that it only has to be adequate, it doesn't have to be a button, get on that, make it more efficient, efficient it's just it's working. Efficient, efficient is efficient, it's working, it's, but it's adequately, but it's open. So think about the operable. Is that all that matters, operable? What's the, who's read 
the, I keep going back to this, Zen in the Automated Cycle Maintenance, who's now read Zen in the Automated Cycle Maintenance, my cycle maintenance up to phase 200. No. Oh. Trying to give you culture. <laughs> nothing. Nothing back. Okay, so, there's uh, two different worlds that we're talking about in user experience, right? In fact, user experiences really can be defined as the clash of these, or the smushing up of these two different worlds. So on one, the one side is what? A user. Huh? A user. Yeah. Quantity. And what's on the other side? Oh. Qualitative. And what kind of other stuff? And we've got the tangible and the intangible. Remember we were talking about all of this stuff, okay, earlier on. And so this is all about old school, if you like, HCI, but we're looking at task completion times, we're looking at how operable something is. We're not necessarily bothered about whether it looks good, whether it's nice, whether it's a joy to use, but it might take longer. We're bothered about what's the task completion time, what's the number of error rates, that kind of stuff. Okay? So that's what we're talking about when, when we're looking at usability. And this is exactly what this efficient experience is about, this stuff that, is it adequately operable? Is it, can you operate it adequately? Not, is it nice? Is it good? Is it aesthetically pleasing? Is it fun? None of that. Just pressing the button as efficiently possible will it give you the results you want. Okay, and that's really what usability has been seen to be for a long period of time as part of HCI. Okay. So, I don't think it's just usability. So, why not just usability? I think of usability in more general terms. The more general terms of efficient use. The concept of usability is much broader than the narrow confines that's often associated with this usability. So, for instance, do you think your experience would be more efficient or less efficient if you're enjoying your interaction? More. I think it's more efficient. Because, why is it more efficient? Okay. If you're enjoying it, isn't it kind of like time flies when you're having fun kind of thing? Yes. Time flies when you're having fun. You're enjoying it, so your synapses are working higher, at a higher rate, you're enjoying what you're doing. Yeah? You're less likely to notice negative sides because you perceive it as a good experience, so you're just going to not look at stuff that might be less efficient? Yes, that's that very true, yeah. And your perceptions are going to be very positive, and so therefore you're going to have a more, you know, a more positive outcome from it all. Okay, um, any more? Okay. Okay, now, as an example of this, we've got, on the left-hand side, a Nest Learning Thermostat. Who's seen these Nest Learning Thermostats before? Yeah, cool, eh? Excellent stuff to say it's the third star. Stupid expensive price though. But you know, good. And then we've got a modern modern thermostat on the right hand side. So just by the way of these two things. This one probably isn't even that usable, but it's kind of this idea of efficient, usable, operable. It's very Soviet, <coughs> isn't it? In the kind of in the pejorative way. It's a big square block building. That's what it is. Then, there we are. And whereas this one here is very California. It's all cool and shiny and, you know, uh, superficial. That's it. Okay? So these are, these, these are the kind of ideas that we're looking at. Now, when we look at these two, which one would you prefer to interact with? Which do you think you're going to have a more, which do you think looks more usable? Which will have a more usable experience? I mean, you kind of just bias it with what you just said, though. Well, I have, I have a good, good original thought, but did I need to bias it? I mean, just by displaying these two together, I think I'm biasing it. <coughs> it's not. Okay, so I'm, it seems to me that this looks good. Okay, they could have designed this to look like that, but with less buttons. Okay, why not? Because the reality is that what we're saying is that this thing here is a learning thermostat. We don't even need to touch it very much. It should just do some, it's got some nice um, machine learning in it. It should be able to understand what temperature you like um, a room at any particular time. Okay? And uh, for any particular part of the season. That's, that's the whole point of it. We don't need to touch it very much. Yet, 
So therefore, they could have just made it a little square grey box with no, with none of these um, little um, um, buttons on at all. That would have been the more efficient way, maybe, of doing it. But they did chose not to. They chose to do something different, so you've got a nice uh, touch screen, or at least a, a screen that actually looks um, nice and covered in. Um, you can see that you've got red to show something, show some information. What's the problem with this? This learning thing I mean, let's forget all the problems with this one. Let's, let's, you know, I'm saying this is a great thing here. What's wrong with the Nest learning thing Yes. If you know how to use it, it might not carry over onto other thermostats. Yeah, it might. So you, you might not just because you know how to use this one, it might not carry over onto other thermostats. So the learning experience dies. Yeah. It's not immediately obvious how to use it just by looking at it. There's no buttons. Yeah, it's not immediately obvious. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's one issue. Once it's once you actually have a physical version, maybe it's better. I don't know. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of uh, feedback, and you only have one huge number, whereas if it's supposed to learn what your preferences are, then there's no way to review those, like what it actually has learned about you. Yeah, that's, that looks like it's the case. Actually, it's not quite the case, because there's a little, you can push it and it gives you some, you can get to get through some menus and bits and pieces. And you can also see where we're up to, where we're up to here, we're at 67 degrees, and it's going to take 20, uh, 70, it's going to take 25 minutes to get up to 72 degrees, which is this bit here, so it gives you some kind of feedback, yes. If it's got a touch screen, it's also probably more expensive. So, yes, it's, but it is a lot more expensive, yeah, that's true. Um, yes? Uh, if you're colour blind, you won't be able to read the display very well. Yes, if you've got some, uh, if you've got vision problems, but you've also, it's this red, big red button thing here, which, so it's conveying something by its colour. Right? Which we already know isn't necessarily the best plan. Okay, if you've not got a different way of doing it, why would this be a problem? Even if you're not visually disabled, uh, okay. Even if you've got sight, <coughs> why, why might this be a problem? Because it might be telling you or trying to buy a sheet of thinking you're having it too hot, like buy it being red. Yes, it could buy that. But also, it's um, colour blind. If you're colour blind, then you know you might not be able to see that red colour anyway. Okay, yeah? I was going to say it doesn't recall as many different things in different countries. So, for example, Japan or something, red means different. I think red means good. Yeah, in, yeah. In yeah. China, China. Certainly in China, yeah. So that's the okay. case. So, therefore, you might, have, you might have differences in perception of the colour itself. So, there's, there, this isn't just a one shot deal where you know, everything's great. You know, it, it is certainly, it, I think it's usability wise way superior to a modern, to a modern firm stat. But of course, there are swings and roundabouts for all of this. Okay. And so, why do I care about telling you this? Why am I telling you? Why does it matter to you? Yeah. To illustrate that there's no right answer? Well, to illustrate there's no right answer, there kind of is, because I mean, you know, screw, screw the one on the right, <laughs> grab the one on the left, what happened? Yeah. Because we're the people who are going to be designing this kind of stuff? Yeah, you're the people who are going to be designing this kind of stuff, so you need to think of all this stuff, you know. If these guys have thought, well, maybe there's some little hookup such that it's, there's a little Bluetooth thing so you can create your own um, application so that you can control the um, control the Nest one from your iPhone such or computer such that you've got some screen reading software on there, etc. etc. That's that's something that's gonna be that's gonna be useful. Um, also, you know, if you're only conveying, if you're only using colour to convey, then that might be a problem too, as you know, maybe it's useful to, to use other different kinds of ways of putting the text on there to say what the red means. You know, if it doesn't mean anything. Why is it there? Okay. So, just so that you can think of it in a bit more detail about what it is to do interface work, there isn't, you're right in the fact that there isn't an absolute right answer for most of this because it's designed. Okay, a lot of it is designed, a lot of it is understanding. But you'll get a lot of designers who think that things are obvious, that things are, this is the way it's done in design. And it's your job to actually stand in the way of these, these people and say, actually, We've got to make sure we've got right the correct provision for everything. Okay, 
for all different kinds of use, even the use that you might not expect. Unexpected use is, you know, is, is exactly it. Think of it as a human exception. You know, human exception handling or error handling or something like that. You know, it's a catch and try. That's what you're trying to be. Yeah. Okay. Ah, we can see. We changed. We moved. We've got a different screen, so we can therefore see um, the different kinds of. Well, we can see what's going to happen on Friday here, so we can see what temperature things are going to be, and we can change it, remove it, etc. So that it can go better. Now, for all of this, I think that this interface, having said that, is way nicer than this interface. Having said this, because on this interface, it's very difficult to understand what all these what all these uh, numbers mean. Okay, it says 62, 74. Yeah, it doesn't tell you anything. There's very little annotation there at all. It doesn't really tell you what's going on. Whereas here, you've got a very good idea that you know you've, got, you've set it at 78 degrees. We can change it. We can remove it. All we done, and we know that this is going to happen at Friday at six o'clock. Okay, pretty much straightforward. I would suggest. But this is a little bit really tricky. Yeah. I'll say that if you show it to like. Someone who's 60 or right, 70, they would be straightforward for them. Okay. Because they've, uh, they've used the other ones for the whole life. That's maybe the case, but I use this, I use something as terrible as this, because you're really cheap. And uh, I use something as terrible as this on a, rate, on a not, not particularly regular basis, and that's the problem. I can't remember how the damn thing works every, you know, if you only use it once every two months. Relearning how the hell it should work is a whole other deal. So I think that one thing also to remember on this is that you might very well be, might be very correct and very true, you might be that you know, this isn't very good for all you it. But it might also be that once it's being used, you can quickly understand what you should be doing again. Whereas this one, if you don't have a, a long-term memory of what, of how to actually work it, then there's a problem. It's like you know a complicated um, watch. If you don't use all the facilities of a complicated watch all the time, you forget. You throw, you've already thrown the uh, user manual away, and you just forget what, how to actually work it. You know, and then you have to rework it out, which is more complicated, I think. Um, but it's a good, it's a good discussion to have. So certainly, you know, keep that in mind in regard to older users. It'd be interesting to do some work to see whether that's really the case. Yeah. Okay. So. Why is it aligned through consensus? There's no consensus. There is no consensus, that's right. So there's no consensus on meetings, so you should just remember this. Yeah, I'm telling you all this, but there's no consensus. Um, okay. Something of usability is software, is, is software specializ specialization of the larger topic of ergonomics. Who's in ergonomics? Okay, so what do we think ergonomics is? That funny keyboard Microsoft uh, Funny keyboard, yeah, okay. What do we think? What else do we think it is? No, not sorry, nearly. Is it sort of designed towards like human beings kind of like that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in my experience it's kind of <coughs> You're given something so that when you're doing something, you don't hurt yourself. That will give yourself, you know, like chairs in an office, for example. Yeah. You, you have a chair so you don't kill your back. And you have another another chair. Okay. <coughs> so actually, it's about human work. Okay, so that's ergonomics is about, it's translated about human work. And so, you know, the lab that we have here at Web Ergonomics, it's about, you know, human factors on the web. Because ergonomics is about the way that it's about humans. And that's always been associated in computer science, etc. It would work. It's not you know, computers originally were not particularly meant to be fun. So it just work. Obviously not the case now. So other three topics as um, tangential with ergonomics focusing on uh, physiological matters and usability focusing on um, psychological matters. Okay. So we've got. This, this idea of separation between physiological and psychological. Do we think this is still valid? 
Does it matter what your um, mobile phone feels like in your hand? Does it matter what your iPod or any of the other kind of devices that are now away from the desktop, does it matter what they look like, what they feel like? Yeah? If, if you've got Beats Audio, you want a red cord hanging down from your ears because, you know, then everybody knows it's Beats Audio. Well, you could just paint a cord red. <laughs> I'm cheap like that. But there we are, you know, so you all know. There's no, the re why, I mean, there is, that's really the only reason why there's a red cord on these audio is so that people know it's Beats Audio. Right? Not, not because the red cord makes the sound experience better. <laughs> you know? Yeah? Back in the day, when we first had iPods in Manchester, security, the security guards, said, told people not to wear camera security, don't wear your white headset. Because then you know you've got a good iPod, so you'll get one. Yeah. Now everybody has iPods. So. Okay, so all of this is so that you're buying into something more than just product, than just sort of how efficient the user experience is or how usable something is. So it obviously matters. So maybe this disconnect between the psychological and physiological stuff isn't so, so useful anymore. <clears throat> so there's plenty of overlapping frameworks for as aspects of usability. We should be taking into account when designing and building systems interfaces. Well, this is very true. There's lots of work on trying to understand the cognitive and psychological processes by which users do their information, you know, do their work or at least do their uh, interaction with the computers. Why? Why? Who's heard of Fitz Law? Kind of, okay, not. Nobody's shouting about it. You haven't heard of Fitz Law? Which tells you exactly, predicts exactly how long it's going to take and how efficient it's going to be for you to use a pointing device to get from one piece of the screen in real estate to another piece of the screen in real estate. In 1958, 6? Something like that. No? Well, you want to read the paper then. It's very interesting. Okay, so that's one of the basis of why mice work. The mouse was designed specifically for Fitzroy. That's its purpose. Okay, so there's lots of models of how we do things. Okay, and so that's something that we need to think about as software engineers. Now, we're going to get onto that in a few slides. But I also want to talk to you about this universal design and design for all. So, who's heard of universal design? You go, you should have. Well, you've heard of it. So, any more? So universal design and design for all is something that you'll, you'll hear about a lot in user experience, certainly in HCR. And it means that generally you're right, the idea is that you have to try to design your products to fit as many people as is humanly possible. Okay? Which means that some people aren't going to be fit. Okay? It means that some people, for some people it's going to be a very bad fit. For others, it's going to be a very good fit because you're taking a model of a particular of a particular group of people. Okay. If I wanted to link two areas of the course together, this statement I've just made and some other area of the course backwards you know, that we've already covered, what might you say? What 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 area might you say? Mm, well, yeah, this universal design that might fit in with what? Hmm? Fits in with accessibility, but what kind of, but let me think of a, a mo, some kind of informal, well, semi formal technique, informal, semi formal technique for uh, transmitting, communicating information about people. Uh, what about personas? Personas, very good. So, personas have this problem that personas are supposed to be an aggregate of lots of different kinds of people into one. And that means you get this idea of a specific user. Okay, but that but things are missing from that persona because it's meant to be very coarse grained. We meant to transmit multiple personas really so that we can try and get all different kinds of users. And so this universal design aspect fits into this persona idea, but it also means that the same 
you know, 10% of the population are missed out because they don't they aren't covered in the universal design, the universality of the design. <coughs> However, the positive point about universal design and design for all is that we're trying to make designs useful for um, we're trying to think beyond just us as developers. So back in the day, we used to just develop based on our own ideas, mostly. And now that's been codified to be called autobiographical design. Okay? We're designing for us, pretty much, as developers. We have an idea, we start to bang it out. And the idea of universal design and design for all is that we try to make sure that this design is beyond us, it's beyond the autobiographical, it's more about as many people as we can actually get in there. However, what other aspects might be useful to add to, say, this design for all, the universal design? Customization, personalization, and adaptability. These three, these three things are very useful for this because it allows us to have a very coarse grain, it's a coarse grained universal design. But if we add flexibility in, if we add um, aspects of um, openness in, then we can start to what? We can start to move the system, we can mutate the system. So we can actually wrap that system, we can have a coarse grained starting point and then wrap it to a very fine grain around an individual. Okay? But this is exactly what um, what is kind of missed in a lot of ways with universal design, even though the intention is that we include everybody, the universality of everybody in it. So it says, a focus on designing products so that they are usable by the widest range of people operating in the widest range of situations, as is commercially practical. Now, reading this, there are plenty of weasel words. Who's heard of weasel words? Hmm? Weasel words. They're words that, mean, that allow you to get out of anything. Pretty much, yeah. So you know, I may be the king of England. I may be. I'm not. I might be. Yeah. Okay. So this kind of ridiculous stuff. Um, you'll find that when people create bad hypotheses, they put this in. So you might say, you know, ooh, the time, the task completion time, might be greater than, might be less than five seconds. Might. Be. Yeah? Okay. So here we can see that we're saying that we've got as is commercially practical. What the hell does that mean? That could mean let's not bother. You know, it's not commercially practical. Yeah. If it's going to cost you an absolute fortune to do something, then don't bother. What's an absolute fortune? Well, and no, if it costs somebody who's got an absolute fortune, a tenth of an absolute fortune is that good enough? But it's not good enough for people who, you know, it's so anyway, these are reasonable words. They're not saying, they allow you to get out of this particular intention. Okay? Because it's probably been written by a committee. Okay. But you should know about it. Okay. So you know, universality suggests to most UXs, I would say that's you guys, most UXs and engineers, that the solution they come up with must best fit most of the population most of the time. Many organisations follow the viewpoint that universal usability means designed for all. Okay. Thus, universal usability is more a function of keeping all of the people and all of the situations in mind and trying to create a product which is flexible as commercially practical, so that it can accommodate the different users and situations. Very true. The bottom part. Okay. This bit. So what we want to do is keep it flexible. So that you might not design, because it's commercially, commercially impractical for you to design something, but if you keep it flexible, then it allows other people to get your product, okay, to, design, to build an API, or build an interface that works on your API. Okay? Okay. Again, my unconventional view. I have a number of views. It's very infuriating, you'll find, especially if you're trying to teach a course now. But, by trying to address all user needs in one design, the technology is apt to address none. Okay? You're likely to get... So in here I talk about... Um, talk about some work that... Who's heard of Alan Dix? So in your notes I talk about some work that, uh, work, um, some work that Alan Dix was talking about. It's about chocolate. 
quite certainly about this, but it's based on chocolate. Um, and so he's talking about the fact that when we design for everybody, we actually have such a horrible bastardised set of uh, outcomes that nobody likes any of it. Nobody's satisfied with any of it. Okay? They would not choose it. So, for instance, email clients, lots of people choose different kinds of... Uh, do you choose different kinds of email clients because they like different kinds of the ways that they work. Okay? They don't all choose Outlook. Okay? Outlook will do everything, but people won't love it. So. And he proves his point, or at least he supports his point, by giving the analogy of a sweet shop. Why do we, you know, if this, is, if, this is a, if this is true, that we've got this universal idea that we've got, we can make something that's universally acceptable by everybody, it can be acceptable by everybody, but it will be chosen by none. And that's why in a sweet shop you have lots of different kinds of sweets, because we all have lots of different kinds of wants and desires. Okay? It's the same here with the software. You don't just have a sweet shop selling one, bar, one type of chocolate because it's acceptable to everybody. You have lots of different kinds because we all have different tastes. And that's the thing that user experience is trying to get in there as well. It's about taste, not just about the least common, the, the most commonly useful set of functions. Okay. Making software usable is not just about a utilitarian view of software use. Okay. It's also about the personal choice of the user. So adding that the ability to personalise is useful. Okay. Greater flexibility and configurability of both interfaces and interactions are the solution. So realising that you don't know the actual outcome or what should happen at the time allows you to create flexibility. So who knows anything about the American Constitution? Nobody. Nobody knows anything about the American Constitution. Okay. Well, are there amendments in the American Constitution? Yes. Yes. What do we think the American Constitution then has built into it? What did the Founding Fathers decide when they actually created this Constitution? Make it open to change and flexible. They made it open to change and flexible because they realised they didn't have all the answers. Okay. In fact, they realised they didn't have very many of the answers actually. Yeah. So that's it. so that's what they did. They decided, well, we're going to create a constitution such that it can be extended because things change. We need flexibility, and that's exactly what you need to do when you're talking about when you're looking at the building of the software. Okay. okay. Now. There's two systems that we would look at. Oh, maybe three. <coughs> so these were created back in the day. Now we'll see this in a little bit more detail in a little while. But there's a tool that's mainly in existence at the moment called CogTool. Has anybody heard of CogTool? Okay. So we'll get to it. It's in your notes. So Cogtool is all about trying to predict the time it takes for a user to make decisions and to execute uh, operations. Okay. And it all came from this, the human processor model. So back in the day, we tried to build, HCI people, tried to build um, models of humans Models of their cognition, models of their psychology, models of their behaviour, models of their physiology, how we took them to do stuff. So they built models, and they, these were very simplistic models, of course, and those models had inputs from external sources, and they also had their internal processing. Okay? So they're trying to capture um, psychology, or psychological traits, in some kind of machine executable format so that they can predict better what's going to happen when you give a certain set of um, information and ask for a task to be completed so that you can predict better when you're presented with certain menus or sets of menus how it's going to take for people to make a decision okay and this all came from Carl, Moran, Newell 
and it was called the Human Processing Model. So it calculates how long it takes to perform a certain task, for instance. Okay. Experiment, experimental times to calculate cognitive and motor processing time. So it allows you to it allows us to understand how fast we can actually move our mouse, how quick we can type without making errors, etc. Okay. And so that allows us to estimate better the interaction, the usability, the old school usability of the work. Okay? Everyone who's semi falling asleep now, wake up. Good, I'm glad that. I can see you from the front now. Okay, wake up! Alright. So, each processor has a cycle time and each memory has a decay time as well. Now, the problem with this is it's not very accurate. Okay? We do this in research a lot. We do lots and lots of interesting stuff and we have a really good time and then we decide, oh well, it's not quite as accurate as we imagined. Then why isn't it accurate? Well, it says there, too many confounding variables. Okay? There's just too many at this point. And there was just too many for this, for the human process model, way too many. So, we decided, I'll tell you what, let's create an extension to this and make it even more complicated, called GOMES. Okay, so GOMES is something you should also remember, because in HCI, when you get out there into UX, they'll talk to you about GOMES a lot. GOMES they like, okay? So here we have this concept of goals, operators, methods, and selections. So goals are the things that we need to get accomplished. Operators, <coughs> actions which we're going to perform on these goals. Um, to get the goal, operations are uh, something we perform to get the goal. And then we've got methods, the sequences by which we're going to do stuff. And the selection, the kind of a set of rules to allow us to guide these um, methods. Okay? It's very straightforward. It's a specialisation of the human processor model. It's reductionist. What does that mean? Yeah. It cuts out some detail. It cuts out detail. That's true. So generally, if you're in a discussion with, uh, so uh, you know, a psychologist and a social scientist, what uh, kind of thing, um, the social scientist and the sociologist see, say, the physicist. See physics, say, for instance, as reductionist because it's right because it reduces everything in the cosmos down to particles, pretty much. Okay, a lot of the time, and they see that as a reductionist thing. They see that there's not, that the world is way richer than that, and so, but well, in a rich world, you get lots of bad variables or lots of confounding variables, and so one way to get rid of them is to say, well, actually, I'm just doing like physicists do, and I'm going to reduce. I'm going to be reductionist. Now actually, science in itself, it, is, it can be reductionist, and that's okay. You know, we learn a lot from these constrained models of, of, of well, we learn a lot from these constrained models of the world, certainly when we apply them in engineering. Okay? That's okay. But there's a point when it becomes too reductionist, such that we can't really say anything more about anything. Yeah? In this case, we've got a reductionist, so, the, the work is reductionist because we're trying to cut out confounding variables, and there's too many confounding variables, so we have to keep reducing. Okay, and the more we reduce, the less we can say because we just haven't got enough data. Okay, the more data we've got, the more confounding variables, so we can say a lot, we just can't be that sure about it. Do you see how that works? Do you see how that works? The more data we've got, the more confounding variables we've got in a complex world. So we can say a lot of rich things, we just can't be 100% accurately sure about those things. The less data we've got, the more we specialise and focus down onto a specific, we can't say very much, but we can say it very accurately. And then again, that's this quantitative qualitative stuff going on. Yeah? Okay. So it expects users to follow logical routines, logical routines, and is not resilient to user unpredictability. How logical do we think users normally, given, you know, exclude everybody in this room because you're all super logical, 
obviously a computer scientist and engineers. Are you asleep? No, good. It's just my voice. Um, so, how logical do you think we are? Most of the population are as humans. Not very. Not very. Yeah, not very logical. So we're trying to say that people do things in this. This Gome says we do things in logical logical sequences to to maximise outcomes or whatever. That's not what we do as people. We just don't do that. Okay, mostly we do stupid things and we make stupid choices most of the time. Okay? And then we try. And, the good thing is that we are resilient to that and we can normally resolve them in some way. Okay, so we realise this, and we realise that even with goes, it's too many confound goes. So we go to this keystroke level modelling. That's what we're up to. Let's model keystrokes. Okay, so this is it. This is this is the pinnacle of our understanding, and that is uh, keystroke level modelling. So again, it's actually. Um, it's, there's a lot of work going on at CMU, Carnegie Mellon, on this, on this keystroke. It's more simplistic specialisation, it's a more simplistic specialisation of go, which means it's even more reductionist, because for now we're just talking about keyboards. Okay? Um, but it is amenable to computation. We can get some reasonably accurate um, predictions out of it. Okay? So we can get some reasonably accurate, some reasonably accurate predictions. But a very specific thing. Okay? So it doesn't tell the whole, whole story, it's not very rich. But I suggest you go and have a look at the comp tool. Okay? So it's quite an interesting app that you can download and install and mess with. It's quite a nice little, it gives you lots of little bizarre graphs. Um, uh, and it's, you know, it's not bad, but it's not great, it really isn't. So the problem is that we, don't, we know very little about the human brain. As I think, as we've said before, very little about that. We know very little about cognition, perception, okay, behaviour, you know, in total. But then to try and model it is even more difficult because then we have to model the entire world, and that's even worse. Yeah. Okay. But it's not a bad start. And we can see that we've got here's a little. Uh, ooh, we'll get a bit low. Here's a little graphic of uh, keystroke level modelling, and you can see we've got different screens, and then we try and define the most optimal paths between those screens and measure how long it will take people to both make the decision of where, what they want to select, and then how long it will take them to, to do the actual task. But of course we've defined this already, yes? Is this to do with keyboards and not seeing what a mouse, what someone does with the mouse? It's not even, yeah, it's not even about the mouse on this, at this level. The, the, the mouse is in a kind of a, an okay addition, but it's mostly now about just looking at understanding what's presented, when it's presented, how long it will take somebody to resolve the decision for a particular task to be executed, and then how long it can, takes for that execution to occur through a sequence. Okay? Yeah. Not great. Okay. I'm not going to go into this because you can see this online anyway. Um, yes. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, ten minutes. So let's have a ten minute break, as I can see some of you are uh, nearly ready to throw yourself in the, in the train. We have a nice little video when you get back. Who's, where's Tom? Tom, who are, who are you? Where are you? Who sent me my? Who sent me a link up to do with uh, zero star? Tom? No? Bastard, not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are going to, uh, you guys are going to watch this uh, little six minute video of the Rockstar. Alright, so tell me about this girl. Yeah. Darwin. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. 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 I mean, you look like it. It's too much stress. Oh, I'm going to ask Daniel. Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, yeah, you're the next thing. Wasn't it because yeah. most sort of modern interests are sort of based around the ideas that uh, society is based on? Yes, well, most of the modern interfaces are based around the uh, this. And so, you know, when we're looking at something that happened, say, 40 years ago, we're still using very similar technology. Oh. So the same? Yeah. The same? The same? Excellent. Okay, so that's, that's one of the key features. That it might look as though everything is super new and super novel, but mostly it isn't. Okay? And that's one of the good things that this uh, that Tom sent. Uh, which we're going to have a quick look at now. It's called Open as a Remix. Now, I don't just agree with everything about this, but it's got a nice little bit with regard to the Xerox Star, etc. Has anybody seen this before? Everything is a Remix. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it's quite interesting. I'm, uh, I was quite taken with it when I was delirious last week. So let's see if we can make it work. No, we can't. That would be too much. What? No, you can't. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Of course, of course, we can use it. first patent was improvement in electric lamps, but he did produce the first commercially viable one, 
after trying 6,000 different materials for the filament. These are all major advances, but they're not original ideas so much as tipping points in a continuous line of invention by many different people. But the most dramatic results can happen when ideas are combined. By connecting ideas together, creative leaps can be made, producing some of history's biggest breakthroughs. Johann Gutenberg's printing press was invented around 1440, but almost all its components had been around for centuries. Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company didn't invent the assembly line, interchangeable parts, or even the automobile itself, but they combined all these elements in 1908 to produce the first mass market car, the Model T. And the internet slowly grew over several decades as networks and protocols merged. It finally hit critical mass in 1991 when Tim Berners-Lee added the World Wide Web. These are the basic elements of creativity. Copy, transform, and combine. And the perfect illustration of all these at work is the story of the devices we're using right now. So let's travel back to the dawn of the personal computer revolution and look at the company that started it all. Xerox. Xerox invented the modern personal computer in the early 70s. The Alto was a mouse-driven system with a graphical user interface. Bear in mind that a popular personal computer of this era was operated with switches, and if you flipped them in the right order, you got to see blinking lights. The Alto was way ahead. Right, that's the Alto. So we looked at um, the mother of all demonstrations it was called. Okay, so it was about the mouse, remember? So what do we look, what can we see here? We have the mouse, we've got the mouse, and what's the other thing we've got? The keyboard. You just kind of call it the keyboard. Okay, so you hold down different sequences while you want the mouse to do stuff or while you want to use other keys up here, which is exactly, exactly the setup that um, uh, Doug Engelbart had when he uh, demonstrated his first mouse on the recorded keyboard and the bits to do with hypertext too. Okay, so this is actually coming from there as well. Okay. That fits time. Eventually, Apple got a load of the Alto and later released not one, but two computers with graphical interfaces, the Lisa and its more successful follow-up, the Macintosh. The Alto was never a commercial product, but Xerox did release a system based on it in 1981, the Star 8010. Two years before the Lisa, three years before the Mac. It was the Star and the Alto that served as the foundation for the Macintosh. The Xerox Star used a desktop metaphor with icons for documents and folders. It had a pointer, scroll bars, and pop-up menus. These were huge innovations, and the Mac copied every one of them. But it was the first combination it incorporated that set the Mac on a path towards long-term success. Apple aimed to merge the computer with the household appliance. The Mac was to be a simple device, like a TV or a stereo. This was unlike the Star, which was intended for professional use and vastly different from the cumbersome command-based systems that dominated the era. The Mac was for the home, and this produced a cascade of transformations. Firstly, Apple removed one of the buttons on the mouse to make its novel pointing device less confusing. Then they added the double clip for opening files. The Star used a separate key to open files. The Mac also let you drag icons around and move and resize windows. The Star didn't have drag and drop. You moved and copied files by selecting an icon, pressing a key, then clicking a location. And you resized windows with a menu. The Star and the Alto both featured pop-up menus, but because the location of these would move around the screen, the user had to continually reorient. The Mac introduced the menu bar, which stayed in the same place no matter what you were doing. And the Mac added the trash can to make deleting files more intuitive and less nerve-wracking. And lastly, through compromise and clever engineering, Apple managed to pare the Mac's price down to $2,500. Still pretty expensive, but much cheaper than the $10,000 Lisa or the $17,000 Star. But what started it all was the graphical interface merged with the idea of the computer as household appliance. The Mac is a demonstration of the explosive potential of combinations. The Star and the Alto, on the other hand, are the products of years of elite research and development. They're a testament to the slow power of transformation. But of course, they too contain the work of others. 
The Alto and the Star are evolutionary branches that lead back to the NLS system, which introduced Windows and the mouse, to Sketchpad, the first interactive drawing application, and even back to the Memex, a concept resembling the modern PC decades before it was possible. The interdependence of our creativity has been obscured by powerful cultural ideas. But technology is now exposing this connectedness. We're struggling legally, ethically, and artistically to deal with these implications. And that's our final episode, part four. Okay, so... We can see that Xerox and the work that went on, went on, went on at Park at Palo Alto Research um, Centre was instrumental in the experiences that you're having today with interfaces. Okay? So the Macs that you've got, in fact, well, yeah, Macs that you've got um, are created directly as part of the, that kind of um, lineage. Okay? So that's what you need to be thinking about when you're reading the Byte article written back in the day, and it's 19. 82 that was written, okay, so before a lot of the technology we've got now, to understand the kind of concepts that they're talking about and the kind of concepts that we can see carry forward into current, um, into you know, your current computing, okay, and interface design. Now, there are many um, best practice, let's call them, or principles or guidelines for usability. Now, Back in, uh, that's not a break. Back in, uh, uh, back when I was talking about accessibility and we were talking about poor and poof, then that kind of, I said something about the sort of agreement that, that the um, academics and researchers and uh, practitioners had about those principles. What is it that I said? I said there was agreement. Okay? So there's very few principles in those accessibility ones okay? because there's lots of agreement. Now, in usability, there isn't agreement. Okay? There's lots of different kinds. Every talking head on the planet who's a HCI person comes up with a set of principles, best practice, guidelines for, for you as software engineers or for the people you're going to be talking to as software engineers to keep in their mind and to use as they're building code. Okay? Not to do with testing, not to do with anything else, but best practice and principles for, to, for you to follow while you're building it. Why? Why are there so many for usability? Why does every talking head do something? Has, new, has some design principles. I know I switched the light down, but you know, that doesn't mean you're going to sleep. Any ideas? Is it because they have different ideas of what usability is or different ways of Well, that's a, that's, that's a good answer. Uh, is it because um, the new things we've been building on what was previously said, maybe? The new things we've been building on previously said? No. In general, it's, it's far, I mean, and this might be just my cynicism. It's because principles, practice, and guidelines sell books. That's it. Okay? So there's lots and lots of repetition. But you can't sell a book unless you say, oh, look, I have some new insight. And here it is. And it's encoded in design principles that you can follow. Okay? Just like gamification, as we'll be seeing next week. Okay. So all of this stuff I've tried to wade through for you. So that we've got all of these different principles in your notes down the left. I'm not going to go into these in any particular detail on the left-hand side. And these are the sources that they appear in. Okay, the kind of principles that are there that, that people discuss. And there's so many sources because you know, hey, let's create a new design principle and sell a book. Pretty much, yeah. There are there is some good stuff in here. But I think if you don't ever remember any more than the Byte article that you actually, sadly enough, if you don't remember any more than the principles as captured within that Byte article that you're going to read, then that might very well be good enough. Because it's absolutely key. And also, it's, it's created from real experimentation. So, while they said that 
Okay, so what did they say? Which which computer was never released? Right. Okay. So Xerox didn't release the computer, but they used they created about well over a thousand of them to use in Park to get the idea right. Okay, that's really it, is eating your own dog food. Yeah, they really decided to do this, and then only then did they move it out. Okay. To the start. Yeah. But all the others were prototypes that they used, and they all used them. So the design concepts and guidelines were evolved, evolved over 10 years, not just somebody pulling them out of their head, but actually from doing real work, building real systems. That's got value. Okay. Now, we've got some more here down the uh, left hand side, you can see. Um, the, the person here who I want you to think of as well, who I want you to uh, think about and, um, and uh, um, maybe even read some of his work, is this guy, Raskin. Jeff Raskin. So has anybody heard of Raskin? One? Yeah? Any more? So who was Raskin? He was the Macintosh designer for the interfaces and all the interaction. Okay? A great guy who said, very intelligent guy, and said that there is no um, intuitive behaviour, it's just familiarity, okay, that's been codified in some way in, in it. Okay. So you should read his book. It's, it's really good, really good work. Okay. Alright. And here we are. We've got lots of uh, here's all the uh, here's all the uh, different uh, references and the one that you ought to look at is the humane interface. So Jeff Raskin's humane interface is really useful. <coughs> Okay, now, I've put all these principles together, I've mushed them up, and I've come out with a set of principles, okay, that you can pretty much keep in your heads, okay, which are combinations of all of the rest, and I've removed the ones that are just, obviously, outliers, you know, so far from the, from the herd. Now, you might want to read all those sources yourself, you might want to. And then come out with the ones that you think are most important, and that's fine. And that's what you should be doing. Once you, if you get into the into user experience more and more, then that's what you should be doing. But for the time being, we're just going to look at these ones. So, lots of principles of effective user experience. So we've got stability. Are the interactions stable? Does it fall over? Okay, that's the that's the first thing. Scalability. Does it scale? And does it scale within the data? So, for instance, um, I've seen some interfaces that were built that look very nice when there's only um, six bits of data, six pieces of data that they're trying to give you. But as soon as they go beyond six pieces of data, because they've created this nice and unique interface, not a table, then it becomes unusable because the data's too much, so it doesn't scale. So it looks great initially, but then it's rubbish. Okay? Um, simplicity. Things need to be simple but no more. Sim things need to be just simple enough, but no simpler. And if that means they stay complicated, they stay complicated. Okay. Um, does it have situational awareness? Do you know where you are, what task you're involved in, and how to complete the task, how to get to the end of completing the task? Does it self-describe? Do you need a large manual or is it self-descriptive as you're going through the actual interaction, such that you can learn it very quickly as you're moving? Um, does it give you this concept called progressive disclosure? Are interface elements presented one step at a time, leading you through a three-dimensional, if you like, interaction? Or, are you, or is everything presented all in one space? Now, in the old days, we always wanted, the, we always thought the fewer clicks, the better. Well, that's rubbish. Because it doesn't allow you to keep a good model of everything in your brain. Okay? So it's better to have progressive disclosure. So you have a sequence of clicks that get that progress you down a route, if you like, down a pathway. Um, familiarity. So we can see that is your system familiar? Okay? We don't have this idea of intuitiveness, it's familiar. So for instance, do you make sure that you conform to the way, to the look and feel of, for instance, Windows, or if you're using the Windows operating system. And if not, why not? Okay, because your users are used to that kind of familiarity. 
Um, learnability. If your interactions are difficult, how do you try and help people learn those interactions or learn the interface? Okay. Is it consistent? Do things change? Do things move? Now, this is a problem with adaptive systems because I've seen a lot of adaptive systems whereby there isn't consistency. Whereby, if you've performed an interaction at some point, then that interaction and the screens that are part of that interaction actually change over time, which means there's no consistency. Okay? Now, that seems like it's helping you out, but in reality, it's not. And robustness is the system robust to others. Okay, so you might get errors, but it's not going to fall over. It's part of the stability of this. And uh, that's how I remember this. Um, <laughs> I think I'll sign that, but there we are. That's how I remember it. If you, uh, if you like to remember it in a different way, that's good too. So you can sort of try and remember that. Now, <coughs> I don't expect that you're going to be, or imagine that you're going to be memorising all of these things for your work. But what you do need to do is keep them in mind, so just keep them, you know, just keep them in your heads, um, the kind of things that you need to that you need to be aware of as you're building code. Okay, that's the whole point of all of these. All of this guideline part here, we have the bit we have the bit at the start where we were looking about requirements, really, requirements of the station analysis. So we understand what the users want. This bit is about all of these guidelines and principles which we already know exist because we've already actually come up with them. So they're there to be in your head while you're building, and then after Easter, you'll come back and we'll talk about how to test what you've built, whether what you've built is what users want, okay? And whether you've screwed it up from the design and citation and analysis in the build, okay? So these are all well-found well -found principles. <coughs> now, <coughs> we're gonna go through each of these, okay, bit by bit. So, questions to think about when you're designing your prototype for interaction stability. I think interaction stability is quite obvious. It's quite normal. You guys must do this all the time when you're building your software engineering code, right? How do you make sure your interactions are stable? Is that right? You're all doing software engineering projects, are you? You're all doing projects. Yeah? So you're thinking, how can I make this stable? You're wanting your interactions to be ridiculous or crash out. Yeah? Okay. Well, I hope so. Otherwise, we're in trouble. So, scalability. Let's get back to this. Scalability. That's the next one. How do we, how, what do we want to think about when we talk about, when we talk about scalability of the interface? Or the interactions? Or the interaction design? Anybody? Yeah. Does it work well for a single thing? Does it work well for like, how, how much can you test it? Can you test it to its extreme? And if it works well for two extreme testing as well? Yeah, okay. So if it works well, so think of the two extremes of use and then see whether it works well for those two extremes of use. Yeah, that's good one. Good one. I was going to say, if you're doing this into my data and you're exploring data on it in an interface, then how massive can you make it? Like how much can you handle it? before it gets um, unresponsive or, you know, just slow or stop working. Yeah? Yeah? Any more? Yeah. Does it work fine on, like, dual screen, like, bigger screen, small screen? Like yes. Does it, does it wrap? Is it responsive? Yeah? To the different kinds of screens and different kinds of devices you're going to be using. That's true. Yeah? So that's good. So we've got, is it, is it, does it scale to the correct device? Does it scale within the data set itself and the interactions? Does it, yeah? You also say that, for example, if it will only work for 64 data sets, if someone works for 65, it has something to tell the user they can't use that. So something to tell the user what the limitations of the application is. True. Now, although I would think about more, at that point, I think about adaptation. So I think that you get to 64 and you've got your nice WYSI interface and it looks really cool. If they give 65, it's probably not a good idea to say you can't do it, but it might be an idea to change the way then that the actual data is displayed or, or the, the data sets are interacted with. Okay. So one thing that you've also got to worry about here is you've created a nice glorious interface. It's a new one that you've built you know, and you think it's really useful and really good. 
how likely is it that you're going to suddenly go, well, actually, it only does you know, really well, it only does 30 or 40 data sets or 30 or 40 interactions or something. Uh, let's chuck it away and start again. How likely is that to be the case? Very likely. Very likely. Okay. Well, I think that you're probably <laughs> unlikely to uh, have done this in the real world because <laughs> that's never likely to be the case. You build something, you love it, you've displayed it to your bosses, they love it, and then you realise, oh my God, it don't work after 20 or 30, or it looks terrible after 20 or 30 data sets or interactions or stuff. And then you don't want to chuck it away because if you do chuck it away, your boss thinks you're an idiot for a start. Okay, so you've got to think about this stuff before you actually get moving on. Okay. <clears throat> so that's scalability. Simplicity. Does it facilitate simplicity? What do we think about simplicity? How do we make things just simple enough and no more? Who's read the book? Don't make me think. Yes, not many, but it's a book that has lots of people who love it. I hate it because, you know. As people, we should be thinking. That's the whole point. We don't want to think any less. We already do, you know, desperately less thinking. Most of the population do. Okay? So, actually, actually thinking is a good thing to be doing. But, we need to think, we need, so we need interfaces that are simple, just simple enough and no simpler. And if that means it's complicated, well, it stays complicated. So, how might you go out about making things more simplistic? Yeah. Is it trying to relate to things in real life, like you were doing with the trash bin earlier? Yeah, you can, you can relate to things in real life. You know, re relate to real um, aspects of people's real life. Um, spe specifically, if you're doing, say, user-centered design, where you want to ask those people who you're going to build this system for, um, just the kind of way that they think, the kind of things that they're interested in, the kind of uses they're interested in. I was speaking yesterday, actually, um, to some guys who were uh, doing some work on with some uh, scientific data and the, the programmers are very focused on procedures, functions, pr put slotting in a visual tool, slotting procedures together, yet the people who are actually going to use the tool are only interested in data, they're very interested in data and they're not so interested in the procedure. So you want a data oriented interface. Yet the actual designers and developers wanted a, pro wanted a procedural oriented interface. So they, the designers and developers want what they want, even though they're never going to use it. And they're not listening to the, uh, to the users, who are biodiversity ecologists. Those guys want everything for them is data, and they're very comfortable with data, but they're not comfortable with the process. They want to see the data and how it's transformed. So those are the people we need to think about. So it might not seem simple to us, the interface in that context might seem <coughs> complicated. But to the people who are using it, it is simple because they know the data and the data to them is simple. Yeah? So the concept of simple needs to change too. Is it simple for the person you're building it for? Not for you, not for the general public, but for the people. That's user-centered design. Okay, situational awareness. So, situational awareness, what do we know about situational awareness? Where is situational awareness used a lot? What kind of critical systems? Uh, flight simulators. Flight sim well, not just simulators, <laughs> flight decks, yeah. So, simulators, are, it's used in simply in the simulators, but it's used in flight decks, it's used in safety critical systems, it's used in nuclear power stations, etc. And what's it mean? Situation awareness. You yeah. have as much information as you possibly can without being too much distracted. Yeah, to have as much information as you possibly can without being too distracted. And it's about understanding the situation you're in. So having a, a good all-round awareness of what's happening both in the case of the flight systems in the cockpit and also outside the cockpit. Okay. So People in the flight situations have a tendency to get buried in the cockpit too much. They're interested in all the bits of, you know, in whether the engine's working right, and whether the altitude's right, etc. But they're not looking out. So the idea of situational awareness is to wrap all that such that you can actually have a good situational awareness of what's happening outside the cockpit as well. Okay. Now, 
that's important for safety critical systems. It's also important and it can be important for lots of different systems whereby you're actually really having to do some control work. So maybe where you're actually controlling um, machinery, controlling the operation of various kinds of, of um, transport, okay, that kind of thing. Understanding what the situation is outside as well as understanding what the situation is inside the, the cockpit or the area that, you are, that you're operating in. Okay? So that's the kind of thing you need to, to think about. So how might we do that for situation related? How do they do it in cockpits? What things do they have in cockpits? Yes. Uh, well, I think they do a lot of uh, quantity of testing in the simulators to see where people learn from what things can be tracked. Yeah, quantity of testing. Anything else? Yeah? I think there's a lot of heads up display. Heads up display, so you've got head up displays, that's true. Anything else? Yeah? You have a user voice prompts if you take it off the ground and that. Yeah. So and speak to you. Voice prompts, voice prompts and auditory, yeah? Do you put similar sort of control items together in a sentence? Yes. Because there's similar control items together and also similar information feedback items together so you can see that the cockpit normally is laid out the same way so it's not a lot less. Um, you know, that's part of familiarity as well. But there's a lot less kind of cognitive overload because you're expecting things to be in certain positions. But certainly using a multitude of different sensory inputs is something that's very useful. Also, what, um, force feedback. Lots of force feedback in the joysticks. Okay, so that you can actually understand, um, even if you're, um, say, even if the wings, even if the airfoils aren't reacting as you expect them to react, the force feedback will still be generating feedback so you can feel them as they should be. Okay? Okay. Self-describing, that's a different thing. Yeah. If you need, like, a massive manual, Yes. So who, who's heard of um, RTFM? Yeah? Who's not heard of RTFM? Okay, it stands for Read the Fucking Manual. Okay. So that's what people say. That's what most software engineers are saying. You know, when somebody comes up to say, oh, RTFM, Read the Fucking Manual, right? Okay, but what I'm saying is we shouldn't read the manual. Okay, it should be, we, should be, we should be able to get from the manual really quick. Okay, and that's what self-describing. <coughs> now, who has heard of self-describing when it comes to what you do, coding? Okay, and who, what, what does that code, what's that self-description called in? I work my boss said that if you have to comment every other line, they probably like that code. Okay, yeah. yeah. So Self-documenting code, but there's, a, there's also a kind of an area, but somebody very famous wrote uh, some really good books on this. I was going to say, uh, variables and method names just say what they do. Yeah. Yeah. You're referring to clean coding? Pardon? Are you referring to clean coding? No. Has anybody heard of literal programming? Nuff. Has anybody heard of Nuff, the art of computer programming? Yeah. Donald? Nuff? Yeah. No, no, well, Turing Prize winner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you should read, you should know this guy for start, and you should also read a bit on literal programming. So, with literal programming, you actually, literate programming, you actually write the code which is the documentation, and then a, a parser strips out the actual code. So you're not writing code, you're writing the documentation and you just so happen to then be able to rip out the code okay, from that documentation. So what, you're, what you've got is a document which you, is then printable. Printable in LaTeX. Okay, so it's really spot on LaTeX. Okay. Progressive disclosure, I think we've spoken about progressive disclosure anyway. Familiarity. It was, well, we now think we know what we're talking about with familiarity. Learnability, now that's interesting, learnability. So, how do we make something learnable? Can you predict what's going to happen if you press this button? Okay, so it's predictable, yeah, you can predict what's going to happen if you uh, predict if you press that button, yeah? To follow the same patterns repeatedly, so like, you know, Follow, yeah? Red button, always in the or something like that. 
Yes? Yeah, that's, that's where it was. Yeah? <coughs> Your hand was up Yeah, I was just going to say that associations Yeah, association with colours and images, that's good. Yeah? Um, use universal instructions like move and copy. Yeah, universal instructions like move and copy. Um, so, for instance, um, there used to be a computer uh, designed by uh, Jeff Askin called the Canon Cat. Has anybody heard of the Canon Cat? It's had a thing called the Leap Key on it, which was a specific key for moving around, and it was kind of a kind of high function key for moving around uh, text documentation very quickly. So that it was mainly designed for people who were personal assistants and that kind of thing, who were, or writers who had lots of text they were creating. And this leap, the leap key, you can see a demonstration of it online. I suggest you do that anyway, without me describing it. But that allowed learnability because you just moved on this one particular key okay, that did most of the actual leaping around and changes and modifications to the text document. Okay. It's a bit like recording keyboards. Okay. Consistency. How do we get consistency? Keep the design of the same, so for example, if you've got a nice user interface on one screen, you've got a button, the whole user interface changes to something completely different. Okay, yeah, consistent, yeah, that's good. Any more for consistency? Yeah? Uh, if you do something once and we come back to it again, <coughs> it should do exactly the same thing. Yeah, so if you do it once and you do it in one way, then it should do it the same way again when you come back to it. Okay. Okay, robust and easy. Now, nearly. Questions for next week, in fact, we move on. All of these principles that I'm talking to you about now, what's the big problem with all of this stuff that I'm telling you about? All these principles, everything? It's all a bit subjective, nothing can be absolute or universally true. Yeah, it's all a bit subjective, nothing can be absolute or university. That's what makes it interesting, yeah? So, but yeah. Anything, anything sort of on a wider, more, more kind of maybe for the They change. They change, that's true, they can change, yeah. Looks like I can make sure I'm updating all the time. Yeah. I think it's a bit uh, ide idealistic, like the real world. I am idealistic. It is a bit idealistic, that's true, it is, but we've got to uh, shoot somewhere yeah. and go, try and go for it. But what's on a kind of a negative <coughs> note? What's negative about it? Is it hard to apply them all? It is hard to apply them all, that's true, yeah. <coughs> okay, so the problem I find with it is it's very constricting. So, for instance, if we, if we apply all these principles, how, many, how likely is it we're going to have Google Glass? Not likely. Okay. If we, if we you know, it, it, can, it, it, it restricts your ability if you're, say, a researcher or you're building brand new interfaces, it restricts your ability to do to build those interfaces because you're trying to maintain maintain consistency with what? You know? Would um, would Microsoft active tiles be created if you were trying to be consistent with what everybody else does? Probably not. Okay. Would the Microsoft who's heard of the Microsoft Courier tablet? Okay, so the curry tablet's dead now, but you know it was really good. So the curry tablet had looked nothing like Windows and wasn't anything to do with Windows, but it was way good. It was a really good interface, but it broke half of these design uh, criteria, half of these principles. So what you've got to realise is that, as well as being good ways to move forward and to build software that's standard stuff, they're also crap when it comes to innovation. Okay, when you want to build innovative interfaces, you know, if Xerox Park were looking to follow the principles that existed at that time, they'd just build DOS or, you know, a version of it, CPM, whatever. Yeah? They wouldn't build this new desktop metaphor because it breaks all the principles that went before. So sometimes it's good so that you can be creative to destroy all these principles and start fresh. Just like Google Glass is doing, etc., etc. Yeah? Okay. Okay. But that means that for the most part, you're going to just be banging out code using standard platforms. Yeah? So, follow the. But when it comes to the time that somebody says to you, here's five million, go.
go and do some really cool innovative uh, interfaces and interaction, then, you know, break all this. We'll make some new ones, it'll be fine. Yeah? Okay, now, next week, Markel is a hard taskmaster, always evil. Evil. He'll be asking you all these questions. If you don't know, that's it. Okay, so what's the significance of Xerox Star interface? One of the five principles proposed by Xerox Star team. What does GO stand for and what does it involve? Okay. What are the ten main principles of efficient design? Remember them however you like. How do these principles differ from Schneiderman? Who knows Schneiderman? Ben Schneiderman, the most highly cited HCI researcher on the planet. Got like 30,000 citations, haven't you? Bastard. <laughs> Anyway, so look at Schneiderman's uh, design guidelines and see how those change. Okay, so remember, next week you've got the pop quiz, we meet, read the self assessment questions, and make sure you do the coursework. Okay. Alright, I'm going to see you now for Friday, I'll see you in two weeks. <coughs> <coughs> <That's cool. laughs> How long is it? Is it a really long one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 how long is this? I've seen a short version of it. Yeah, it's slow. Ages. 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 I don't hate, but I don't want to go pay for it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Okay. Um, so I'll look at that and then I'll get it re well I'll get it remarked. Um, so if I get it remarked and um, I'll let you and I'll then get some additional feedback and then we've got and we'll get that done today. And then you can You'll get an email from me saying, you know, this is what we marked and this is what the feedback is now. And then we can discuss if you're unhappy with that, then we can see it tomorrow. Oh. Yeah? Oh. Okay. Okay, no problem at all. Thank you.
is only it, it's just only one problem that we need like demonstration device and device and no, I mean, everything that you need to think about is in that actual application, you know, because it was pre-filled. Yeah, yeah. you know, so, so, sort of re respond, referring to that, to that um, ethics procedure, if you like, in there is all you, yeah. need to, all you need to do. So you're getting five users to, what are they doing? Is it a thinker language? Like? No, it's the, uh, you're doing the, uh, you, the um, teachers on you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, so all you have to do is follow the... It's the think about protocol, isn't it? Yeah. It? Yeah. So follow the think about protocol, and that's you can, if you just Google it, you get think about. Oh, right. Yeah. That's right. Um, no, I just wonder whether there's any specific numbers about whether, like, how many users I take and um, how long I take them for. No, it says there it shouldn't go on for more than an hour. You yeah. shouldn't do it in any uh, private places because yeah. uh, the door should be open or it should be a public place because otherwise. You know, there could be some issues in propriety. Um, and um, you've got five users, so no, five's okay. Because it's think about it as a qualitative, not quantitative. Yeah. So you can't get any data, any stats out of it really, but you can get some qual good qualitative rich feedback from it. Yeah, yeah I was just checking there is no uh, nothing else that I've already done for us. Um, no, it's yeah. not at all. It's 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 very the, I mean the think about protocol is very straightforward. And Five users is good. Just make sure that you, um, you know, you make, you're making notes and see what they're thinking. You know, they're yeah. supposed to enunciate. They're supposed to talk while they're doing something yeah. of how they're feeling, how they're thinking. You know, not just yeah. what they're doing, but what they think about what they're doing.